Hello and welcome to Rock and Roll to Success. Today, I have the honor of bringing my friend Luke Dayton directly from Australia. Luke is here to raise the impact of coaches, healers, shamans, service providers through his coaching. But he also has a very cool cacao company as well. So, Luke, thank you for coming, man. It's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks, brother. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to speak to your audience and speak to you and just have some fun and, and see where the conversation flies and talk about all those different things. So, um, yeah, let's let's have a good time and bring that intention to serve the highest good and, and see where it takes us. Yeah, that's one of the things that I love about your message, Luke, because I think we resonate a lot with this, of having this purpose of trying to like raise the level of consciousness of other people trying to help them break their limiting beliefs, that kind of thing. But usually I like to begin thinking of the journey that brought you here. So I know that you liked basketball a lot when you were growing up and you also have a very interesting relationship with your grandpa. So how was yeah. your, how were your early days and how do you think they shaped you growing up and becoming who you've become? Yeah, hundred percent. So um, we had a really great childhood. Like our parents were like the, in my eyes, the perfect parents growing up. They were really loving. They gave us every opportunity that we could ever dream of. They really poured all of their love and attention into us. And um, it wasn't exactly the most functional relationship for them. There was all of these things that I've now realized that impacted the way in which I related in different aspects in the world but we had a great childhood we had a great okay every opportunity you know from a schooling perspective from a sporting perspective they really just like allowed us to go where we um, were passionate about and that led me down the path of basketball and um you know played at a high level over here played representative basketball and semi-professionally over here and that got me into a whole different range of skills and leadership spaces and ended up being president of one of the local basketball clubs over here and um, so it was an interesting time. I went to uni, didn't really enjoy it. I walked into the lecture and just instantly got the the bad vibe from my lecturer. And I was just like, this is not a space for me. And I, I, I really chose, you know, I was like all of us are, we're pushed to choose something, you know, and, and have no idea about who we are. I chose architecture purely because I like drawing straight lines and I thought architects made a lot of money and that was my conditioning and it like, and that was my conditions and that was my reasons for it. And I, um, and I knew I could get that score really easy without having to work too hard in school. Um, it wasn't exactly a high entry level score and I could use all of my study periods and go and focus on my sport. And so. Um, that became a really easy choice and then six months in i was sick of having no money and, and being poor broke uni student uh, and not really going doing what i should i was just partying and playing around on campus and um being a little bit destructive and thought it's time to get out of here i need to change something up so i came home got a job that led me to working through the mines and working into everything that's going on and you know one thing led to another and a year and a half into that, I'd just finished my traineeship and started supervising. So um, one of the youngest supervisors in history at the Lumina refinery and um, leadership's always been something in my space and leadership's always been something that I felt really called to along with the coaching. And um, that really appeased that part of me for a long time. Um, the coaching and, and the supervision space and that mentoring and growing a team and working towards goals and, and the money was nice too, man. It was high six figures. Uh, <laughs> The easy. I was working four and a half months of the year, um, home every day, five weeks of annual leave. Um, it was a great, it was a good life, right? But it wasn't a great life. And that's what I sort of started to realize. Um, started having those conversations about moving up through the leadership pathways. And my bosses were sort of saying, well, if you want to get to a, if you want to get higher up in this company and this, and this business, then you need to be emulating these people and and the people that i was being told to emulate like when i looked in their eyes and when i spoke to them there was no life in their eyes they had no joy the only time they had enjoyment was when they were talking about things outside of work when they were disconnecting from the environment they were in and i started to make this association with like wow like that's not really where i want to be that's not what i want to live my life with i could easily stay here for the next 30 years and provide a great life for my family and not have to want for anything put my kids through school and all of those kind of things and but it wouldn't i've had regrets and i'd be 
I'd be living a lie and I, I knew that that would eventually end in a dysfunctional way, you know, whether that was a breakdown in my relationships, whether it was a breakdown in myself, whatever that looked like, I realized that at some point that would become negative. And so, you know, when Elijah was born, we had COVID, that was a good kick in the ass, um, obviously through all the mandates and that came through in COVID in the mining industry. And, and that wasn't a path that we wanted to go down. So we were like, well, what are our options? What are the other exits at the roundabout? Um, and then Eli was born as well. And, and we really started asking, what kind of a world are we creating? What kind of a world are we a part of? Are we happy with the way that that world's going? Are we happy with the direction of that? And the answer was no. And then it was the next questions were, well, are we just going to sit idly by and let others and hope that others do something about it? Or are we going to go out and start creating it? Um, and so we made that decision to go out and start creating it. And um, in that time, while I was there, I'd been working on the business with my sister called the Genius Portal, and that's an intuitive development school. And so I, I stepped in there full time and then started leaning on all of my other skills in the leadership and the marketing space and my background in those spaces and put together some packages and started like spreading what I was doing. And slowly over time, that's evolved into this coaching space where I've felt the most call and where I feel the most pull and the most energy. We just shut down, you know, th this transition has been evolving even over the last couple of months. You know, we just launched a new program. I shut down my highest ticket offering, which was a 65K a year thing. Um, I shut that down, transitioned people out of that. And, and, and now we've gone in at the entry level to be able to impact more people with that mission of raising that collective consciousness of impacting people for generations to come so that they can move forward and and you know that not just my kids but their kids after that and 20 generations in my lineage they know that we were making decisions speaking of lineage eli's just walked in but uh <laughs> <laughs> um Welcome, making, eli. <laughs> you gonna go up mate go up and tell it um making decisions that hello in, <laughs> uh, so yeah making decisions that um Oh, you drink Singing the Lion King, The Circle of Life. Oh, I loved that as a kid. Um, and, and making decisions that, you know, 20, 20 generations down in my lineage, they know we were making decisions with them in mind. And I really want to help people have pathways where they don't have to feel like they have to do something just because someone else tells them. That they have freedom to be able to create, that they understand what it looks like from an energetic point of view and, and really understand themselves at the highest level, right? So that they can unlock their potential at a level fitting their truth. And for me, when that comes from a pure place, then that's how we're going to raise that collective consciousness. That's how we're going to shift that balance of wealth, of the flow of currency, of everything in the 3D and the physical world in a way that's more aligned with nature, in a way that's serving the highest good rather than serving, you know, negative energies or whatever you want to call it. So that's um, that's a bit about my journey and there's lots of learnings and there's lots of defining moments in that you mentioned like the relationship with my pop and who's now passed it's been a year since he passed like a couple of days ago and like just that relationship evolving and seeing the way in which he was so afraid of sharing his past and being open and sharing about him um out of fear of losing love right he had this guilt and this shame about his upbringing that he thought it was going to cause us to love him less and as his mind started to let go in those later years, he really opened up. And all it did was create more love, right? All it did was show us, give us more insight into who he was, the way, the why he was wired and the way he was, and allowed him to open up about some of his regrets and pass those lessons on to us. And, and it was really around family. It was really around being who you are and really showing up in that way and understanding that the greatest love that we have for ourselves is the love that we have for ourselves, right? That's the greatest love that we can create. Um, and by doing that, we attract more of the people into our lives who are going to love us for everything that we are. Um, and so that was one of the biggest messages from him. And that's something that I reflect on and try and bring through in the kids and, and in, in my content and in everything that I'm doing, including like, you know, my personal branding stuff, coaching businesses, and also Hybration Organics, like the cacao brand. So um, the Genius Portal, work in the men's hub space and men's workspace and all of those spaces that come with that philosophy of just trying to help people understand themselves at a higher level so that they can express their truth and they can flow in the in the most free-flowing way within themselves. I think this is beautiful, man, that you've taken this path of really looking 
to work with your purpose and really finding purpose that this is something that most people nowadays don't even seem to look for it. And you did and you found it and that's beautiful. And how much do you think that your relationship with your pops and especially in these later years in which he was opening up more, how much do you think this might have influenced you to think about these things and kind of rethink your life because you had a very good job, very high paying, but at the same time, you didn't want to live the same life that the guys above you were living. So you didn't want to live 20, 30 years and have your life sucked out of you. So how do you think seeing these examples of older people influence your decisions? Yeah, oh, massively, man. There's a great book, The Five Regrets of the Dying. It's, it's um, written by a psychologist and, and someone who went through it. It was a palliative care palliative care nurse sorry, who was like interviewing people in palliative care and asking them their top five regrets and collated all that into a book and and so many of them are around family right about friendships and connections and love and and doing the things that you love and so that's been such a catalyst and inspiration for for me through through some really dark times in regards to my parents divorce and like my hero my dad really going off the rails and, and learning from those lessons and starting to come from a place of gratitude for those because they've given me such a grounded resilience. They've given me such a different perspective on the world and and also the way in which we externalize and the way in which like realistically the only one that has to believe in you is yourself, you know, and, and that you need to have that belief and you need to have that inner resilience and that not to look for an external savior. And that's been such a key catalyst and, and same with my pop you know like he had those messages he had those conversations and he had those regrets because he didn't show up for those that he loved right he prioritized himself in a not in a functional way not in a powerful way but in a dysfunctional way and so that's been really important for me because one of his regrets was like prioritizing his own sport and sporting achievements over you know being there to watch his kids sport and not having that relationship and disconnecting in that way and and so for me, it's it's coming at that from a functional mindset. And, and that's a lot of what I do in the, the coaching space is really just shifting people's relationship with things from dysfunctional to functional at the simplest terms. And so we can have a functional relationship with that in regards to it's really important to prioritize your own well-being, prioritize your own happiness and joy and all of those things, but still understand the reason why you're doing it and make sure that they're a real big factor in everything that you're doing, you know, so you can still enjoy the things in life. It's still really important for me as a father to have my own time to do things, but I also need to be able to carve time out to be super present with my family, to be able to impact and have time for Elise, to create time for Elise to go and do the things that she wants to do. Um, Elise is my partner, um, you know, and create space for her to be in her divine feminine and really step up into all of her power as well so because i know that that will then allow me to step up into more and that's a beautiful ecosystem and a beautiful relationship and that all stems from like understanding those lessons and and not seeing them not harboring any guilt or resentment to those moments you know i it, even until recently i really saw i attack i associated like my parents divorce i had guilt and shame there because in regards to having this idea that because they poured so much time and energy into our own sporting and our own achievements like for both my sister and I we've completely not doing anything that is in close to that now you know and so there was um like regret and shame around that and, and thinking and associating that because they didn't get the time to spend on themselves they didn't have the financial situation to go on holidays and enjoy their time together that they separated and they grew distant and and so there was this attachment and association with that and and just reframing that diving in doing the inner child work diving back into those moments and just shifting that energy or that attachment from a place of resentment and guilt and shame and those feelings to one of gratitude and love for those moments and for everything that they did because they did it out of love for us uh, and shifting that perspective has been really really powerful and um, I'm a big believer in one of my core principles is that we come into this world with a, a level of creative capacity available to us. So energy and, and all the energy that we have at our disposal. And when we reclaim, so all of those different points in our life, if we have a dysfunctional relationship with that, if it still triggers an emotion, if it still triggers a response in us, then that's taking energy. 
you know if we think about we've got three pathways of our energy that we can create with and bring out into the world we've got the energy that goes into the past the energy that goes into the present the here and the now and the energy that goes into the future and so as creators which i'm sure a lot of your audience are in that creative space one of the most important things that we can do is understand ourselves to the higher level to understand where our energy is flowing and to where there is energy leaking back to our past dive into those moments go into the pain go into the traumas shift that percentage shift that perspective reclaim that energy so we don't have energy leaking back there so that we can put that energy into the present into our future creations in a functional way um, and so we do a lot of that work in the coaching program we do a lot of that work in regards to understanding yeah i'm sure a lot of people have heard this saying before you know where your focus goes your energy flows but a lot of the time hey buddy a lot of the time it's the subconscious hey man what are you doing go go Baby. Oh, where do babies come from? That's probably not a question for this podcast. But so happy. Um, Dad. Having that moment where we're understanding that our subconscious rules the show 90% of the day. Like you and I right now, I've got conscious energy going into this conversation, but we've got subconscious narratives ruling and going and taking energy and sending energy in different places. And so understanding that and understanding that the subconscious has a real big connection to our ego and our survival mechanisms. And so our subconscious will be looking to recreate the things that it knows it can survive in, which is all of those moments. All of those moments in the past, it knows it can survive those because we're still here today in the present living. And that's what it really cares about. And so it will put energy into recreating those until we reclaim that energy and direct it in the areas that we want to with intention right and that are true for us to do and that's when we can start to really create at a high level and it's amazing just the simple shifts that can take place in that space and the, the massive results that that can have in your life and how can we reprogram our subconscious so that we don't keep reliving those moments just because they are familiar and we know we can survive in them yeah mindset is everything right if you think about your connection to to energy it comes in through our head, it comes in through our crown, hits our mind and our brain first, right? So we take that energy in. So we really need to shift our mindset into a positive, more positive framework, more creative mindset, a functional functional patterning. And that's about repetition and action. The most important thing for me is having a vision. Having a vision allows you to know where you're going. That takes your body out of a stress response. So, you know, stress, anxiety, fear, most all of those are caused by not knowing where you're going. You know, that's what stress is. Stress is a fear response based on not your brain going, I don't know where we're going here, so I'm just going to put us into fight or flight. When we have a vision, we sit in tension, and that's more motivating. So that tension, tension is the gap between our vision and our current reality, and it's sitting in that and saying, okay, that's where I want to get to. This is where I want to, that's where I am right now. How do I put steps in place to do that? Uh, and that's what, again, reprogramming yourselves is all about now. We know our epigenetics, the way in which our cells are programmed, is based on our behaviors, our social networks, the people, the energy around us, so the energy that we expose ourselves to programs ourselves. Um, and if we don't, the thing with those defining moments or those traumas and those moments in the past is if we don't go deep enough to actually understand the why and the specific story belief value and identity that that moment creates in us and reframe that to a positive one and then put energy into that positive one through taking actionable steps towards it so i.e i don't get up in the morning i sleep in it, this may be your story you know this might be one of your dysfunctional behaviors so to reprogram that we want to set our alarm we want to get up we want to do positive things in the morning that take positive action because that's going to reprogram those cells. And it takes about 60 days to reprogram our cells. And this is why it's important to have that action piece because it, there'll be people listening to this podcast going, having moments of awareness and go, ah, oh, ah, oh, right. But if they don't put any action into it over time, two weeks from now, their, their programming will just come back in because that energy subconsciously will still be going back there. Um, and so we want to put those systems in pro processing in place like completion is a great one so diving back into that moment 
mining the gold of that moment, learning and reframing it into a lesson rather than a hurdle that you've overcome or rather than a roadblock, seeing that as a lesson, seeing that as something that you can have gratitude for and love for. And that completely reframes that. And when we have that, we can go, we can sort of go, what am I going to create now? What's the action based on this? What's the differences in my behavior? How does this align with my vision? And how can I move forward with that? One of my great gifts is being able to stay calm in the chaos. Um, that's what I do. And that's why it's cool that Eli's coming up to show that and still being able to deliver a message. And Because when we go into those moments, we bring that energy to the surface. No yeah, you've got an impressive gift, man. <laughs> No, the way you're no. delivering, it's fantastic. I appreciate that. Um, but it's something that I need to be really skilled in, right? Because I do do a lot of energy work and I do do a lot of emotional work with my clients and bringing stuff up and being able to keep them in that vision and stay grounded and calm in that. Because when we're working energetics and when we're working, understanding ourselves at a higher level, we bring a lot to the surface. And that creates emotion, that creates a reaction, that creates tears, all of these things. And we need to be able to allow that to flow, feel safe enough to go into that chaos of the feminine uh, and then come out the other side with the masculine and bring that order back to the chaos. Uh, so that's really, really important. And he's a great, he's a great training ground. Uh, yeah, completion, like I said, completion is one of the best tools that you have in diving into that reframing those stories those beliefs your values and identities and just understanding just having that process or just that understanding starts to help you shift it awareness is a is that one of our greatest superpowers but the real juice comes in the implementation and the action and a lot of people get stuck in the awareness space and just creating knowledge creating more information um, gaining more information and gaining more awareness about themselves through whether it's consuming content on twitter youtube whatever it is but then they find them they stay stuck. They stay in that same situation. They repeat the same patterns over and over and over again. And if you don't get down to the core of that and get specific with that root issue, just like in your garden, that, re that weed comes back up in a slightly different way, it slightly manifests in a different way. And so we've got to pull that weed out, but then we've got to really make sure that we action because that weed's imprinted in our dna it's imprinted in ourselves and if we don't take the action to cement that new way in then we just revert to that old pattern and that weed regrows and that dysfunction regrows and we still have energy going towards it and so we subconsciously create a negative outcome again and people get really frustrated with that and do you think because they say you can't out train a bad diet do you think you can out mindset a bad environment and that process of weeding out the weeds. Do you think that you can get to a point in which you f you can say, I'm done, all the weeds, they will, they will never come back. I have done enough shadow work. Now my shadow is fully integrated. Or do you think this is kind of impossible? You will always have something. I think at every level, so laws of physics would suggest not, you know, like we can have awareness of it. I think we all, we all will still get in our shit. We'll all still get in our resistance, no matter what level you are. Like even the highest level creators on the planet, they get in their shit. What happens is you get better tools, systems, processes, support networks to pull you back out of that, to keep you in alignment, to say, hey, look, that's some really shadowy shit that you're talking right there. You need to go and have a look at that. And so... Coming to terms with that as well, and just from a polarity point of view of like, as your greatness grows, as you step more and more into your truth, so too does your ego, so too does your shadow. It's, po it's polarity, right? There has to be balance. It has to grow. It has to grow one with the other because otherwise we're not experiencing the growth. And especially in the extremes, we have to go into the extremes of both the functional and the dysfunctional to learn where that place of neutrality is, to learn where we go to. And so I think it's an ever blend ever-ending journey that we just get better and better at having awareness of of recognizing of putting tools and systems in place to move through but for me it really does start with that mindset piece because that's the first point of call for energy reception in the body and everything around us is energy we're energy everything every idea that comes to us money currency it's all energy right it's all an exchange of life force energy. You know, we all exchange our life force energy for currency. And that's how the 3D world's set up. Uh, whereas 
in nature, you exchange a life force energy to receive more life force energy. It's a cyclically like sort of give and receive ecosystem. And so when we realize that and when we can create that flow of energy through the mind and realize that's our first point, then that mindset can overrule a lot of things, right? Because if you're talking the mindset overriding your environment, eventually by having a positive mindset, you're going to make the decision to get out of that environment. It's going to give you the confidence, the courage to be able to take that step. And we see this in social spaces more so than not. Like herd dynamics is something I talk about a fair bit in the content. And it triggers people because it's a reflection of where they're at. And it's a reflection of not being able to have the courage to take a step, to stand alone for a little while, to find your new network, to find that supportive community, because that's what you have to do. If your current environment is holding you back, you have to have the courage to be able to step out of that, to stand on your own for a little while, to be able to find the people that are going to be able to take you forward, who are going to be in that energy, who are going to be moving forward at the same space. And I heard dynamics keeps us, wants to keep us safe, right? That's that mammal instinct to say safety in numbers, to not step outside of the herd, to not be the black sheep, to be the white sheep, and to be in that space and be just following the crowd. That's how we're conditioned. That's how we're, that's not just in our schooling and environments of like social structures, but also in our DNA. We're tribal by nature, so we thrive in community. We want to survive in numbers because we know that that's the number one way in which we can survive is in a pack and a community. And so, when we start to make those shifts, it can be really, really challenging and really easy. And a lot of the time the herd will do everything it can to keep you where you are because it knows it can survive there. And it's doing it from a place of love. You know, I've had that in my own space and I lost, you know, I've separated and disconnected from a lot of friends I had before I went all in on myself. But they, one, they weren't where I wanted to be. And so like that energy was holding me back in a way. But two, they were coming from a place of love and I don't do that because they didn't, they don't have that, that, it's not something that they're familiar with. They don't understand it. And so they have a fear response to it and naturally want to keep you safe. And it's, and it's from love, but it doesn't serve, right? And that's the, that's the, making that shift between that functional way of thinking and a dysfunctional way of thinking. Like you can love someone as much as, as much as you want in the world, but if it doesn't serve their purpose, then it's really just self-serving for you. Um, and you've got to be comfortable with that and comfortable enough to let it go to allow that person to go and do what they want to do. And what's important is that you're still there to support them if that doesn't go well, right? So still having that ability for them to come back in and have that support network and um, have what they need in that space is important too. But yeah, mindset can overrule a lot of things, 100%. But I, I feel like to answer your question, it'll be an ongoing ongoing thing for every level of expansion for every for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction and so for every level of expansion you have you will meet the same in your resistance and for me if we hold this premise that we have a predefined purpose that we come into this world for as energy we come into this existence to fulfill a purpose or to fulfill and learn lessons then our greatness is predefined and so too are our shadows so too is our darkness, so too is our, as our night. And as one grows, so too will the other. And those dysfunctions are always going to be there. So all of the stuff that I worked through from an inner child perspective, from a you know, generational trauma perspective, from a healing perspective, those core dysfunctions or those core parts of myself will always be there. And they will manifest at different levels and, and different ways at each level that I expand because they're a part of me. They're always going to rear their head to make sure that I'm comfortable and I'm in my own awareness and I have enough, you know, I've done what I need to do to unlock that next level of power. For me, that's how I sort of view it, um, that that's that higher self's path of putting the hurdles and the challenges in place and to be able to unlock more and more of that power. And so that's always going to resonate. It's always going to be a part of me. And to reject that and to want to completely rip it out from me so that it never rears its head is rejecting a part of myself. It's removing a part of who I really am, a part of that energy that I've been gifted with to come into this world with. Um, and so, yeah, I really embrace it now. I really embrace when that those moments come up, when my resistance comes in, because I know that there's growth on the other side of that. You know, I've conditioned and programmed my mind to see that as a positive so that I can step into that uncomfortable, step into that growth space and, and really unlock more of that potential that I know lies within. Yeah, like you said, there are levels to it. So as you go up each level, both your light 
part and your shadow part will come up in different ways. And I think it's an interesting point that we can learn how to integrate some points of the shadow. And it's funny that we're talking about this because I'm doing some journaling lately. And one of my prompts is like talking to my five-year-old self. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me that I should play more with my shadow, that I shouldn't try to like leave him in the corner of the room, that he's actually a cool guy and that he has some cool things to tell me. And that I should integrate him more. And it, it's kind of interesting, those journaling prompts that we give ourselves and just write without thinking because they yeah. kind of bring up those things, right? Yeah, 100%. We take that energy outside of ourselves. It's like talking in a third person, right? Like it disassociates the emotional side of it and it just allows it to flow and you can just speak and you can just remove that emotional attachment to what's coming through. Whereas if you're in your head, and thinking about it in your head, it's quite easy for your ego to sort of start to rule the show and start to have the conversation and paint it in a different direction. And um, yeah, journaling is such a powerful tool. It's such a powerful process to be able to just write those thoughts down and then go, oh, wow, where did that even come from? That came from me. Okay, well, let's dive into this. <laughs> I've obviously <laughs> written it for a reason. And, and this, like I said, the shadow play is really cool to understand that it is a part of you and it's a really important part of you. It's one of the most important. And for me, I talk about this in the program a little bit later on in the sort of metaphysical part of the program at the back end where we sort of get into some cool philosophies and some of the things we're talking about here. But like for me, the ego is the gatekeeper. The ego is really the gatekeeper to all of that power that you're here to bring into the world. That's that your subconscious, it's your higher self's like safety mechanism essentially. And it puts the hurdles and the lessons in place that you need to learn and that you need to go through to be able to step more and more into that power. And so a lot of people reject the ego and have a bad and negative view of it. For me, it's one, like the most important part of us in a way because it puts those lessons and hurdles in place. It sees exactly where our current weaknesses lie. It knows where it can sort of try and crack at the edges and get us to go backwards and stay safe and all of those ways. And it tests us and gives us the opportunity to grow gives us the opportunity to take a step forward towards unlocking more of that potential to understanding ourselves at a higher level possible to removing the restrictions in our flow across our physical our energetical and our spiritual flows within our body removing those restrictions through growth through processing so that we can flow as the energetic beings that we are and be a conduit for that energy and not you know not twist that energy based on our own dysfunctions or negative relationships with it because that's what happens we go back to the mind again if your mind's off straight away if that energy that you're receiving is for your heart but your mind's off it's going to warp that and put it into a dysfunctional relationship with your heart and so all of a sudden the way in which that energy then comes back out is twisted it's warped it's based on those thoughts those feelings those beliefs um the negative mindset for example and, and that's how that sort of shows up when someone, if someone says to you something out of love and they're doing it for the right reason, but you perceive it as an attack, no, you know, all of a sudden that's painful in the heart where that energy was actually with good intention and it was from a place of love. And this happens a lot with my clients. It's like, no, I'm coming from a place because I want you to succeed. You know, I'm doing this because I love where you're going. I love your mission. I love your why. I'm being hard on you from that space. I'm pulling this energy off i'm pulling this emotion up i think i'm back and just glitched a little bit but um i'm doing this from a place of love and because of where you're at in your mindset that mindset in your brain is re-tweaking that energy causing you to feel an emotion in your heart because it's come through in a negative way and so that's a really important part of the process and a part important thing to understand it truly is i think one of the things that people get really caught up on are exactly what you said. Sometimes someone is saying something from a place of love or even from neutrality, but you take it from a point of view that's totally skewed from what they were actually trying to say. And even sometimes yeah. some random person like the waiter or some random guy, like he says something. And if the person has that mindset, that more of a victim mentality or he has some kind of chip on his shoulder. He will interpret that in the worst possible way. And 
be pissed off. And many times, if you look from a third person perspective, it was nothing. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, the only one that can make you feel anything is yourself. You know, even if I got punched in the face, from the moment of that physical contact, it's contact. The only one that allows, sure, there's like I might have a broken nose, and so there's physical pain that lingers and all that comes with that. But from an emotional point of view, the only one that makes it mean anything moving forward from that that would actually make me feel an emotion is myself. You know, oh, I'm weak or I can't defend myself or I'm, you know, I can't fight or whatever. Like whatever that story is, the only one that's running that narrative is me. And it's a really, it's a really big one, especially like there's a lot of TV. Um, obviously, domestic violence is, is horrible. And we want, we want to shift that and, and change that. But again, like that, shifting that awareness to having that responsibility and that self-awareness and that radical self-responsibility to go, okay, cool. Like, yes, that happened and it's bloody shit. But from now, from this moment forward, I can make a choice to not allow that emotion to impact me moving forward because that then just carries on that emotion. That just carries on that moment and makes it a bigger and bigger and bigger moment and has more impact on you than it should do or could do. You know, and shifting that perspective and talking about that. And we've had some really powerful conversations in regards to abuse and that with my clients and because I work with both men and women. And that's a really empowering space to be in, to be able to dive into those topics and really just reclaim that energy, understand that, yep, cool, there's there's obviously a dysfunctional relationship in the way that that person's behaving to be able to impact in that way and to be able to have that result on someone else, you know, to hit a woman, for example, is just absolutely atrocious. But we don't want to allow that to continue to linger. We want to be able to have the awareness, have the processes and the support to be able to dive into that emotion, feel it, understand that, you know, there's always, we always have a part of responsibility, you know, like if, for example... Elise went out and cheated on me, for example, right? We'll bring it back. I'll, I'll stop talking about Elise. I'll bring it back to me. If Elise went out and cheated on me, for example, sure, I could have animosity, anger, and hate for that. But it will be based on, at the end of the day, it will be based on something that I'm not doing. That she has had to go and seek something else out in her life because I, as the man in her life, haven't been able to deliver something. You know, and it doesn't excuse the action, doesn't excuse the like the cheating, but it's taking that radical self responsibility of like, well, I actually created that because I haven't been stepping up in this space. You know, as the leader in this relationship, as the man of this relationship, as the masculine leader in this relationship, it's my role to lead and to create. And if I don't step up into that space, then I don't create a space where the feminine feels seen, heard, loved, and so it's going to the feminine is going to go want and go and want that you know it's like if your partner comes up to you and continues to if you keep coming if she keeps coming up and going for a quick cuddle and you come running into the office and you've had a long day and you keep pushing them away what's going to happen they're going to disconnect you know they're going to go look for it somewhere else because that's what they truly want they just want to be seen they want to be loved they want to be held um, and if you're not willing to do that then don't blame her when she goes off and, and gets a hug from someone else you know, it's like you've created it from not being in connection with the person that you're with. and um, So, yeah, there's some really powerful ways to interpret it and just that radical self-responsibility and understanding that as the predominant creative force in our lives, that we create everything that happens, good, bad, and ugly. And we can externalize that and blame and disconnect from it, or we can take radical resp- responsibility, self-responsibility, and go, okay, cool. What did I play out? How did I play this out? And what part did I play in this? What's my role in this? What's Why is this a reflection? Why is this reflecting in my life? What parts of my life are causing me to reflect in this way, to create that, this in my life? And it's a really powerful way to be able to shift your life to a more, a more positive outcome. And do you think there is a baseline that we must be at? Because if the person's still over here and they have a victim mentality and they are always blaming other people or or external circumstances for things. They won't even be able to resonate with everything that you're talking about. And also going more into the, the relationship thing, do you think that currently we live more in a place of having weak men or are the women also to blame for some of the things in the relationship space? 
Oh, there's always two stories to the sort. There's always two stories, and I'll answer the um. Look, if something that I say triggers someone, then awesome, like you're welcome, because the triggers are always a the biggest place for growth. Like it's no one that someone says and and saying it in a neutral way. It's not like I'm doing it to it hurt anyone. I'm not doing it with the intention to hurt anyone or trigger anyone. Right, I'm coming from this place of just being open and speaking. And if something that someone says from that space triggers you, then like that's that's an internal thing. <laughs> there's some there's something going on deep inside that there's emotion that's triggering that response that is worthwhile looking at. And um, I always find that the spaces in which to the resistance is is where you should follow, um, and that that's the period of growth. So if you have a resistance, if anyone listening has resistance to what I'm saying, please reach out. I'm happy to work through it. I'm happy to help you out. Um, if you have, I'm a big believer. If you have feminine wounds then you should work in the feminine space if you have masculine wounds then you should work in the masculine space so a lot of my clients have masculine wounding in regards to relationships in regards to fatherish wounds and those kind of things as well um and for me i've done a lot of work in healing the feminine and i'm working in ceremony working with women learning from women as well you know so um the second part to that question he likes trying to eat coins <laughs> <laughs> What was the second part to that question? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. If you think that currently we have more of a oh. weak yeah. man create hard what times kind of problem, <laughs> or if these weak men of today were actually raised in a way that kind of set them up for failure, because yeah, like when they yeah. were at school, you couldn't do anything that boys usually like to do, and like kind of cutting their roots or their they're weeds, they're boy weeds, so to speak. Yeah, hundred percent. I think um, in both aspects, the divine masculine and the divine feminine is crying out for help. Like it's it's wanting people to step up and step in, and there's and there's you can see can, society is conditioning us at the moment and put, really pushing this narrative of extremes, one or the other. You know, you're either fem, for feminine or you're against it, and that's not how nature's set up. That's not how the ecosystem works. That's not the divine masculine or the divine feminine. Um, and so, yeah, I think to me, there's lots of rooms for growth on both sides. Um, there's lots of room, but as men, look, the, if we go right into the nitty gritty of like feminine energies, the feminine, yeah. thanks, buddy. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. For yeah. uh, we go into the yeah. like core nature of the feminine energies. So. We started this from an individual point of view. Feminine is what birth, creativity, connection to source, connection to intuition, all of those things. So for you and I as men, we will have a set percentage of feminine energy and a set percentage of masculine energy, more than likely higher in the masculine than, than the feminine. But it's the feminine within us that allows us to tap into that intuition, that allows, that allows us to tap into the greatest vision of who we are, the vision of ourselves, the vision of us as a man, right? That's, that's as two men here. And then it's the masculine that allows us to bring all of that into the world. So if we hold that premise, then it's the feminine energy that sees the masculine in its greatness and holds them and brings them to the path. And then it's up to the masculine to get out of its own way and make a choice. You either run away from that path or you run down that path and you lead the feminine down the path. So there's a surrendering on both sides. As men, we have to surrender to the idea of internally there's that feminine connection that actually allows us to be the best version of who we are because it taps us into that vision space and into that connection to source and energy and then we have to be prepared to step back into that masculine space and be prepared to lead whatever that vision is and have the courage to do so and then in our relationships so for me it's been the women in my life so far that have seen me in my greatness that see my heart that see my truth and then provide the opportunity for me to step up to the plate, step up to that path. Sometimes I get dragged kicking and screaming, you know, the loving mother, the nurturing mother that turns into the strict mother. This is a prime example of this. She sees you in your truth. She sees you where she believes that you can be greatness because she just has her love for her son and she dragged you to that path. And then as a son, you have the opportunity to start leading and living that life, right? It's no different in our relationships. Elise sees me in my greatness and she surrenders to me to bring her down that path. 
to lead that vision, to be the one that's out of the front, that's leading that vision. And I have surrendered to her, for her to see me in that greatness, in that relationship and hold that accountability and see that path and set that vision. And so we need, we need to find the balance. We need to understand and bring the balance back. That's for me, the biggest issue at the moment. There's just so much disconnection. There's so much separation. There's so many so many men out there who are solely focused on creating an external image of going into the gym and thinking that that's the number one important image. But again, for every op- action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so when you just focus on the physical, what are you, re- what are you rejecting? The emotional and the spiritual. So you create it. A-, a lot of guys go to the gym from a dysfunctional point of view of like wanting to be strong, right? Show this strong persona. It's not connected to their why. It's actually more so an egoic, egoic reaction to a fear, and that fear is appearing weak, right? And when you do that, when you when you completely reject the physical, when you completely reject the energetical and the spiritual, the emotional aspect of your life and yourself, what do you do? Create a weakness. So the very thing that you are afraid of, the very thing that you are trying to not create, you create. And that's the rules of creating: is that when we create from a point of fear, we just recreate. You know, our focus, our subconscious focus is on that fear of not appearing weak. But in doing so, we blind ourselves to the aspect of creating the rest of those weaknesses in the emotional and the physical. And so for me, we learn those lessons from nature. As le- nature is always trying to find balance. Uh, it always wants to be in balance. It always wants to be a part of a greater ecosystem, giving back more than it receives because it knows that the more that it gives, the more that it receives. And therefore, the level at which it can give increases and then the level at which it receives increases. That's ecosystem, right? You think about a tree, a singular tree. What's it do? It grows its roots. It goes up towards the sun. It takes in all the pollution. It provides oxygen for every other living creature on the planet. It takes up nutrients. And then at the end of its time, so it gives, it gives, and it gives. And at the end of its time, it goes back into the earth and it feeds more trees. You know, and then it gives more than it's received. And that's the beauty of ecosystem. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Um, and it's no different in our own spaces, right? You and I, we give to our communities and we receive more back from our communities, which increases the level at which we can give. So we give more and then we receive more. And that's the beautiful, regardless of the way in which that exchange comes back, whether it's currency, whether it's life force energy, whether it's love, whatever that might be, we receive more than we give. Um, and we need to find that balance in the masculine and the feminine as well, based on that idea that, you know, it's, I, I have a philosophy and a theory that I've been workshopping and, and diving into lately that we come into the world, like our energy comes in with a pre, before all of our conditioning, before all of our restrictions in flow, when we come in as that pure energetic being, we have a predefined capacity for both masculine and feminine energies. And so maybe for me, that's 70% masculine, 30% feminine. And so within me, I have an obligation to remove the restrictions in my life that allow me to create and utilize that energy at that capacity by working through my blocks in the feminine, by working through my blocks in the masculine by structuring my day you know and what we're what i'm working on now with clients is in actually structuring finding out these percentages and then structuring our day and hacking our system to align with that the most so that we can create at that highest level and our most alignment and and alignment with our highest truth but because we know that there's a balance that 70 percent masculine energy within me and the 30 percent feminine is constantly gravitating and seeking it's whole, right? And I believe that's the beauty of being in a relationship with someone else is that where that true love and that yin and the yang comes in is that gravitating towards each other to create that whole so that you create at the highest level possible. And one of the most beautiful things that we can do as humans is to recreate, is to give life to something else, is to give a birth and that beautiful sacred relationship between man and woman and giving, giving birth to like our boys, you know, like that's the greatest gift that I can give the world is our boys. Um, and as, and when we come back to that place of radical self-responsibility, the greatest capacity or the greatest level at which we can do that is to unlock 
all the restrictions so that when we make that connection, we have created at the highest level possible without our own imprinting, without our own traumas and all of the stuff that's in our DNA and our cells being passed on to the next generation. And when we, then that's where we start to talk about generational trauma and those kind of things. So responsibility wise, like, and, and I didn't know that I, like, this is a new theory for me and something that I'm working on with my clients. And so having that realization that because I wasn't prepared to work through those traumas before I had kids, I've passed those on in my DNA is a pretty heavy realization to work through. It's a pretty like, as a parent, it's like, geez, I've passed this on to my kid in my DNA, in my cells, because I haven't had the courage to be able to, or just the knowledge or even just the opportunity to work through it. And then we can start to, so some of the work that I'm doing now is healing my own inner child stuff, not only for myself, but through the boys, right? And having those conversations with them and telling them that I love them every day, making sure that they know that they're perfect just to say, ah, oh, that they'll never not have my love. All of those conversations to heal those wounds that have come up and that I'm starting to experience now and, and really like tap into of, as to where my creative blocks are and where some of my woundings are, realizing that I might not know, I, I won't know the answer if that's actually worked until they're like 12, 13. You know, that's still seven to 10 years away of actually like really doing this process and taking these actions. But if I'm serious about taking responsibility for what's mine and that I've passed on, then that's what we've got to do. Um, and the more we can do that, the higher the next generation, like the higher the level of power the next generations will have, the more deeply connected they'll be to their divine masculine and their divine feminine, their creative power, their creative energy, and they'll be able to create at a whole new level. And I have faith that that level at which they create will be the purest, will be more a more pure energy than what I'm creating with because I've we've, we've done this work and we're working through what we need to work through in this space and yeah it's an ever evolving ever evolving theory but the more I sit with it the more I've worked through it with my clients in regards to that masculine or feminine balance and then structuring hacking our day the more it resonates the more it makes sense the more it starts to fit my idea to what the universe is and that energy and that beautiful balance of the masculine and the feminine and, and it wanting to find balance and it wanting to find it's it's partner and it's, and it's soul. We do that first and foremost within ourselves so that we can understand ourselves at the highest level and then that allows us to call in that perfect partner, that perfect match of what our energies are. Um, and so Elise and I are doing some really cool work in that space and I'm really allowing her to step into her divine feminine and the chaos that that brings and feel those emotions and clear those emotions and, and do what I can as the man and as the masculine to make bring order to that and make her feel safe, make her feel seen, make her feel comfortable enough to step into that chaos because I know that I come back from this position of if my if my highest priority is to love myself to the fullest, then to do that, I have to have a strong woman with me. I have to have a strong feminine influence that allows me to step up into that masculine power or to everything that I am. If I want to be the best version of myself and step up into all of my power and strength as the masculine man, then I have to create a space for the woman in my life to be able to step up into all of her power because as we've just spoken about, it's the feminine that leads the masculine. Yeah. When you were talking about this, I was asking myself, how do you think that we can know when someone is compatible with you in terms of the energy and yeah. choosing a partner that that makes sense because you two are compatible some way yeah so that masculine and feminine so for me it's like diving into the structures of what feels good like when so for elise and i we we've got to practice that we've got to do shortly and just like redefining our family vision so what does that look like? What are we creating as a couple? What are we creating as a family? What does that vision look like? And then stepping back from there, and then we can start to align with what what does what does this look like? What does this look like? And how do I, as the, as the man in the relationship, how do I lead this? How do you lead this in your family? And how do we lead this in our relationships? Like understanding that Elise still has like masculine traits and a masculine energy that she needs to be able to utilize and grow into, and we need to be able to have different ways in which that looks like. So maybe for us, that's like if we're homeschooling the boys, at least bringing the 
order to that she's a music teacher so having her in that control space of the music and the drive and the space behind that allows her to utilize both those energies and i guess the confronting part of all of this and the thing that you have to get the more that you understand yourself and the higher level that you want to understand yourself the more chance there is that you realize that maybe your relationship is actually based on a subconscious fear or about an egoic space and then you're going to have to have that conversation around what does that look like for us moving forward? Is this something that we can work together with or does that actually create a separation where we go on our separate ways? And this is something that Alyssa and I have had some great conversations around in regards to with all the everything that I'm doing currently in regards to understanding myself at a higher level, doing all of this growth, I guess. Like if she's not willing to come with me, then what does that look like? Because if I have a functional mindset in that space, eventually what, what we know about her dynamics is that at some point, if I'm serious about reaching this vision and the vision of my truth and the, the truth of what we want to create, and Elise isn't willing to work through what she needs to work through in order to create at that highest level and support that, then knowing her dynamics and knowing that that energy is going to be not just holding back the vision for myself, but the vision we have for our boys then that's a conversation that we need to have in regards to, well, if you're not going to be doing the work on yourself, if you're not going to be understanding yourself at a higher level, at some point we're going to separate. At some point there will be a disconnection. And that's it's a hard thing for people to, it's been a hard thing for us to come to terms with and really tapping into, well, is that what we would actually love? And of course not. Okay, well, then we're committed to doing this work. Then we're committed to understanding ourselves and, and stepping into those pains, those fears, those all of those emotions because we realize that we're creating something together and in order to serve each other to the fullest of our potential and capacity we have to work through that otherwise we're doing a disservice and that's a hard thing for people to understand it's a hard thing for people to wrap their heads around because a lot of the time we're in that fear space we're in that our mind is coming from a place of survival um, and it doesn't want to change. It doesn't want to go out of the, com under the comfortable, and our relationships are usually pretty comfortable. Most people have a pretty comfortable relationship where they don't really challenge each other, they don't really set boundaries, and it creates a lot of dysfunction, but it doesn't serve at the highest level. It doesn't serve either party at the highest level, and it's the same, it's the same as the philosophy we spoke about earlier in regards to being an open book. This is one of the reasons why I, I try not to, like, change the way in which i have conversation with people the way in which i try to be an open book because again it, there's nothing worse than having an idea of someone based on the mask that they wear and then getting a year into a relationship or working with someone for a year and going this is nothing like the person that i first met like this is like completely different like this is a completely different energy like what's going on here um and i did that for a long time i I wore a lot of masks. I did things that weren't fitting my truth, that weren't true for me to do to fit into society, to fit into a social group, to fit in with friends out of a fear of not having love and not having connection and not having, you know, friends and social groups. That created a lot of pain, not just for myself, but for the others when I started to go, well, this is, I don't actually want to go out and party anymore. I don't want to drink. I don't want to do these things because I don't feel aligned. I don't feel like I want to do this anymore. And that created separation because I had been lying to myself, had been doing things that weren't aligned with me. So I sort of try and be as open as possible now to allow people to feel that vibration, to feel that energy and make a really, make a decision like straight away where it's like, okay, cool. I really vibe with this person. I can dive in. I might not agree with everything that he's saying or like can wrap my head around everything they're saying right now, but I understand that he's coming from a good place. I can feel his heart. I can feel his vibration. There's something here for more for me to explore. Uh, versus if I came in really closed off and wearing a lot of masks and not really giving much, everyone would go, oh, this guy's a bit arrogant and a bit of a jerk. And, you know, or I could make up stories about my success or whatever. I could talk more about that and someone will get a really different idea of everything that I've got going on in my life, you know. So, yeah, I think honesty and transparency is like the best path forward. And the more we can do that with ourselves, that means the more we can do that in our relationships. That gives permission for people to do that for us and that creates creates the love that we're looking for really for ourselves and for our partners and for our kids too. You know, I don't want I don't want Eli to grow up or Eli and Noah to grow up with a misperception of who I am as a person 
want to be able to talk to them about my flaws, like where I'm growing. And it's, once they get old enough to understand what the hell I'm talking about, at the moment, it's just like trying not to imprint um, too much of my shit on them because that's what we do as parents, right? Um, we, we often in, allow our shit to impact on our on our children. And so that's a big focus of mine at the moment. Yeah, I'm, and I'm glad that you're making this change and being conscious of these things and not wanting to let them live that generational trauma that gets passed from generation to de generation. And I'm not sure about this, but I think our generation is the first one that's actually thinking about this and trying to consciously not let certain things keep going on and running in the family. And I think this is a great thing that we're trying to do. And I hope that the next generation and then the, the next one after that end up better because we try to, you know, there are certain things that there's no point in letting them live just for the sake of it. And I'm glad that you are one of these parents that are trying to not pass these bad things to your kids. And, you know, I think that sometimes it's hard to be the black sheep like we were talking about in the beginning. And people sometimes in a loving way, sometimes in a not so loving way, maybe they get a bit jealous, maybe they don't understand. There are many reasons for this, but it's kind of hard when you say, no, I don't want to party, I don't want to drink or... Even in some groups, people do drugs, people do other things that you might get to a point and you say, you know what, I, I don't give a fuck anymore if I don't, if you guys don't want to be my friends, if I don't do certain things, I don't care. Yeah. And yeah, man, thinking about these things and about showing up with your authentic self. And I know you talk a lot about the genius and finding your genius so i'd like to ask you this like how can we reconcile with our, our authentic selves and then how can we find our genius as well yeah cool man so the starting points are like where you most feel it is like an inflow where's where's time stands still where does all of those sort of places where you just time doesn't matter nothing else matters you're just focused on what you're doing and you're in the moment um, whatever that might be, it might be writing, it might be podcasting, it might be being a plumber, whatever it is, it's that slight like sort of starting point right where that time stands still. And, and from there, we want to understand, well, is that just you disconnecting like from everything around you? And that's just the like most pure thing that you have right now. And we do that in, I do this with, in a certain way with my clients. So what we do first and foremost is to get them to write out their 10-year goals, their visions for themselves, who they are, what they think they want to create. And I do this from the post person, like the point of view of the mind. So what your mind wants and, and what your mind thinks that it wants to create. And then once we have that, we have 10-year, 5-year, 3-year, 1-year, 3-month, 1-month, daily. What does that look like daily? Um, we can start to sort of map that out a little bit. And then I guide them in a meditation to do that from a point of view of their heart. So without the mind in place, connect them to their truth, connect them to everything that they are, and then gather the themes of what that life would live like. So what does that look like from a family point of view? What does that look like from a career point of view, from a relationships, from a, the way in which you behave, all of those feelings, and we get down those energies and we write those energies down. And then we cross-reference. And a lot of times they're very similar, which is great. But a lot of times there's differences. And then we dive into the differences. We dive into the why that that's a difference. Why is there a difference there? And a lot of times it'll give us an insight into the ways in which our subconscious is trying to hold us back, keep us small, self-sabotage, all of those things. Bridging that gap between the vision and like what our mind thinks. And that gives us a great framework to be able to work back from. So we'll get themes of what it's true for you to create from a career point of view where that great flow is, where we feel our most at ease, where we feel our most graceful. And then we can start to really hack our systems, create and take actionable steps towards that, which is so, so important when we come back to that vision piece. Because as once we have that vision, we can really start to work into the beliefs, the limiting stories and all of those things that are going to hold us back from getting to that vision. All of the things where we feel resistance to or we fear fear in going after, 
that's where our biggest growth is. And so having that vision allows us to go, okay, I'm doing this for that. This is my why, this is my reason. And we want to develop all of those things. And that allows us to tap into that genius and then take actionable steps towards that, cementing that as the new way of living, cementing that as what we want to go and create and what we want to do in the world. And then put in the support, the systems and the structures in place to allow us to step into that. Because it's not easy. Nothing, nothing that is awesome in the, like that's there for you to create and is awesome is going to be easy. It takes hard work. It takes dedication. It takes shifting what you need to shift from a identity point of view, letting go of all those old identities that you have. Like you have to be willing to shed those and, and move past all of that to create that vision and, and step into whatever that looks like. And for some people, it'll be the best to be the best mum mum that they're supposed to be, you know, to be the best father, it might be to be the best plumber, whatever that is. That's what's important is that they're loving what they do and they live more in alignment with their truth each and every day. And, and if we can do that more often in the world and more so in the world, then the world will be a pretty cool place to live in. Oh, definitely, man. I, I always ask people, about their definition of success. And I think it has a lot to do with what you're saying about your purpose and having your own purpose, not something that someone told you, that a teacher told you when you were 12 or something or your parents or whoever it is, but something that's really true to you, something that makes sense to you because it's aligned with your values, with your talents, with the things you like and and this is something that's really missing in the world and that I hope that through our work, we can help people really find their purpose and actually even having the notion that they should look for their purpose in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it comes back to the choice, right? Because we can't begrudge anyone that chooses not to do it, right? That, that creates a negative energy in itself. All, all we want to do is plant those seeds. We want to allow them to connect to that and then everything comes back to choice you know there's it's i may get to a stage in my life where i'm like okay the vision of what i want to create is not like i'm choosing not to do that anymore i'm choosing just to I've met my match i can't go on or whatever it might be and i doubt that that's going to happen but we can't begrudge people for making a choice to just stay where they are too you know we all can do is plant those seeds and encourage them as much as they can and um, find the find the theme, but if we can connect people to that why, if people are truly connected to that why, then they'll want to make the choice, right? The choice becomes easier when you're truly connected to that vision, when you're truly connected to that why. It's just a lot of people don't look deep enough to find out what that why really is. And what about the connection between the physical and the metaphysical and how this influences us? Yeah, cool. Um, now we're getting into the fun stuff. So the quantum quantum and understanding like how energy works and, and all of those things and i won't go into two there's a great if you want to have a look at well like why so many people say focus creates reality where your energy goes your fo where your focus goes your energy flows the double slit um theory the double slit experiment is a great one to have a look at it's basically where they started to push those electrons down those down the channels and, and showing where the interference patterns and all of those were. And that's the greatest example from a scientific point of view of focus creates reality. And so from those principles, these are sort of like the very principles that make up the universe. And where, I guess, because they're not really spoken about in our current schooling curriculum and schooling setup, it's sort of seen as like woo-woo, woo-woo pseudoscience or woo-woo bloody creativity or whatever you want to call it. But you'll find that most of the top creators in the world all in on their intuition. They all understand their focus and creates their mindset. Um, their focus creates their reality. So their mindset is so, so important. Um, understanding the way in which they interact and understanding the way in which they operate, working through their self-systems, working through working through their self-sabotage, all of those things, that they understand how important that is. And so I think where a lot of people go wrong in this space is thinking that one like big business is bad one that money is evil all of those kind of things and they have this fear response around that and um, i think in a lot of ways there's some there's some truth in in the way in which it can be used in the world we can go into sort of like hollywood and all of the mainstream and you know all of the the devil worship thing that sort of goes on in that space in regards to the content and the lyrics and all of those things but at the end of the day, that's 
it's not big business or money that's evil. It's like the action. And it's only our definition of what evil is too, right? It's only my perception of what's evil versus good and evil or good and bad or pure and evil or whatever you want to call it. It's only my perception too. Someone else's perception can be completely different. And so, again, we come back to that that truth and that understanding of what our vision is and our why is so, so important because that's the very makeup of our genetics. It's the very makeup of our DNA. If we have that premise that we're all energy, it's the very reason that energy transmuted into this physical representation into you and I. Physical, that's where that metaphysical component comes into it, understanding that that's our connection to something so much greater than any of us can grasp right now. So again, coming back to that, reducing the restrict amount of restriction and the amount of flow that we have in our energetic body, this physical container, because it doesn't matter how much growth you do in the 5D, in the spiritual or the energetical, the level at which you can create here and now in the physical, which is where you are, is directly linked to your physical body to the level at which your physical container can actually hold that energy and utilize it and this is why i think like the body positivity movement is a load of shit because all it does is create like and not body positivity from like being in love with yourself like i think that there's some healthy place but i mean like celebrating obesity is a load of fucking shit you know all it does is limit the amount of creative capacity you have it makes you malleable it makes you controllable because you're not confident you don't have the courage when you're really really pushed to the limits of what you can do as a person you're not going to be able to go as far and so you're going to crack you're going to crumble you're going to crumble to those pressures you're not going to be able to bring as much energy into the world you know and that's something that's been really landing for me recently is so many people in the love and light community you know talk about just spreading love and light Love and light's great, but you need action. You need to be doing things here in the physical. You need to be taking action. You need to be making moves because that's where you are. And unless you're going to get yourself to a point of view where you've got no restrictions at all to the point where you gravitate, like resonate at a level that allows you to just evaporate up into the 5D or whatever some people are trying to do, you won't create at the highest level. You won't create here in the physical because you're rejecting it. You're rejecting money. You're rejecting all of the things that the 3D world, the physical world, the world that we live in, reality, is has all around us, right? And so the funniest thing for me in that space or like the biggest realization in that space is that to go to the 5D or to go to evolve and ascend as some people want to talk about it and talk about it in this space in regards to the metaphysical and the spiritual elements, to go to that level, there's a desire to leave the 3D or leave the physical, right? And if that desire is based on fears based in the physical or in the 3D, you'll never be able to ascend because you have a restriction in your flow. You have a negative or a dysfunctional relationship with the very part of you that is here in the present, the right now. And you have to understand the gift that we've all been given to be in this place of life, right? To come here to learn the lessons that we're here to learn, we have to embrace that and have gratitude for it. And if we're serious about helping the vast collective, where are they? They're here in the physical. They're here right now with us. They're going through the struggles. They're going through what they need to do. So for me, being all spiritual, being all love and light without actually taking action is the biggest problem. It's more of a problem than those people who aren't able to see things within the world, aren't able to pull themselves back and sort of of see how society is controlled and how everything's conditioned to keep people a part of the consumer machine and consuming 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 exchanging their life force energy for currency and all of those kind of things that's a bigger problem than those people the the bigger problem for me is those who can see it who's are in the spiritual space who are doing work on themselves but then rejecting the physical rejecting the 3d rejecting reality rejecting all of those people around them that they say that they want to help um, and so, yeah, it's interesting in regards to the metaphysical and the energy of that um, and aligning that restriction because by rejecting that physical, you create a restriction. So you're in counter opposite to the exact thing that you're trying to do, which is trying to elevate your awareness, elevate your consciousness. But if you're not willing to accept where you're at and accept that you're human and accept that you have a physical body and all of these things, then 
doesn't matter how much work you do in the 5D and the, <laughs> the spiritual, the energetical space, you'll still be restricted in that space as well. So yeah, it's really interesting concepts. And for me, the metaphysical connection to that really stems for me from understanding that yes, there is something far greater than what we can comprehend. Yes, there is all this energy around us that we can harness and utilize at our disposal, but we're also here in the present. We're here in the now, we're here in the physical. We're here doing the thing in this reality and this life in the modern world. How can we utilize those systems? How can we utilize those structures and utilize all of that to the fullest of our abilities to create a bloody awesome life here in the now? You know, and I've had to shift my thinking about this of wanting things here of wanting to live a good life, of wanting to have abundance, of wanting to make a lot of money so that I can impact at the level that I want to impact at. You know, and for a long time I was sort of reverse in that. I was I thought money was evil, so I didn't want to create it and therefore I created an energetic block. Money money wants to go, it's energy. It wants to go where it's wanted. It's currency. And so by holding and holding that rejection, I was telling it not to come to me. Yeah. And I was cock blocking myself from ever creating the vision of what I wanted to create and so shifting that and being okay with wanting nice things being okay with wanting to be able to treat Elise to be able to allow her to buy things to be able to allow her to make herself feel good in a materialistic way as well because we are in a material world and so getting okay with that has been a big shift starting to put the processes, the systems and all of that in place to facilitate all of that has seen such a shift in that space for me recently. So that's really important to understand, I think. And a lot of people in the service industry that are interested in spirituality, that are healers, shamans, all of the people that I work with, one of the biggest blocks around that is a lot of them get into the work because they have a dysfunctional relationship or they've had a negative experience in the corporate world in money uh, with money, seeing the greed and seeing all of those things. So there's a subconscious and underlying fear in regards to that. And by not accepting that and accepting that in order to actually change the world to the level at which most people in this industry want to, with good intentions, with pure hearts, you actually have to create a big enough entity to be able to transfer the number one resource at the moment in this world is money, right? It's currency. That's the number one thing that makes everything tick. And it's born from our life force. And we can get into the word etymology and all of that as to how that all relates back to life force energy. But at the moment, for the mass amount of the population, it's currency that rules the world. And so how can we as service providers and people who want to achieve in a holistic way, how can we transfer that wealth? How can we transfer that currency into a space where based on our definition of what we want to create, we, we're doing it with the pure intention. We're doing it for good. We're doing it in a reflection of nature. Again, everything in our world is a reflection of nature. Nature's been here way longer than us. And as humans, we've learnt from nature. So how can we align that and that the, what we do and everything that we're doing with a better intention and shift that flow of currency? One, it's by actually appreciating money and by loving money and wanting it to make it and gravitate it towards us so it doesn't feel rejected. And two is by creating big enough entities and big enough projects and businesses and companies and all of those things to be able to transfer that currency into a direction that we feel is actually going to raise a collective consciousness where it gives back more than it receives because that's the one thing that corporations big, big corporations do, and a lot of the ones that control the world, what do they do? They take more than they receive. And that's in direct opposition with nature. And if we learn what nature does, it gives back more than it receives as a part of an ecosystem, whereas the consumer model takes, takes, and takes. It takes from the earth, it takes from each other, it takes from ourselves. Its core role is to take. And so it's in direct opposition with the laws of nature. And for me, that's a great indicator that it's a wrong system or that it's an out of alignment system with how everything has been designed to do. And so the more we can shift that currency into one that actually aligns with nature and gives back more than it receives, the greater the world will be. But in order to do that, we have to have people who want to do that step up and create big things, create impact, get over their shit when it comes to big business, corporations, money. 
and all of those blocks and all of the things that so many people that I've had conversations with in this space, I'll go, but you've got to be off service. You're doing it for the wrong reasons if you're doing it for money. No, you're doing it for the right reasons because you're doing it to create impact. You're doing it because it's your why. Money is a byproduct of that. But if you're serious about impacting and helping the most amount of people possible, you will go out and you will bring in money because you know that money at the moment runs the world. And if you're serious about creating that, then you have to get serious about loving money, everything that comes with that, and wanting nice things for yourself because your external world is a reflection of your internal world. Your external world is a reflection of your mindset. And so if you're living in scarcity, if you're living in poverty, if you can't pay your bills because you're trying to do things for free to help people out, what are you going to create? You're going to create more of that. You're saying to yourself that you don't have self-worth, that you don't value your time, you don't value your product, you don't believe in your service. Because at the moment, the number one form of exchange in regards for your life form of energy is currency. That's what allows you to do all of those things. It's what allows you to have the freedom to be able to create at the highest level possible. It's by having that money behind you, by having those income streams, by having those services. And so by rejecting that and trying to live in poverty, by trying to do things for free, by trying to offer services to people for goodwill, it doesn't get you very far. You know what? I've been there and I've tried that. And so I know that it doesn't work. What started to work was when I shifted that mindset, when I started to shift that and go, okay, I need to create a big thing. And I came out of that corporate world during COVID thinking, oh, geez, all these corporations want to do is make money. It's all they care about. And yes, that's true. It doesn't make money evil. It doesn't make money bad. It just means that those people, regardless of whether it's no different to you and I in our relationships and our energy, We'll stay in a dysfunctional relationship. We'll stay with a dysfunctional partner. We'll actually stay where it hurts us. You know, domestic violence, again, is a great example of this. How many women do I know that have stayed in poor relationships because they, it's easier to survive in that relationship as, as much as pain, as shit as it is, their body knows how to survive there. And they still at some point want that connection. They stay in that relationship. And we're no different, right? And money is no different. Energy is no different. Money wants to be wanted. And if it, even if it doesn't care like what that outcome is, it'll go where it's wanted. If that results in a negative, what we perceive as a negative outcome in the world, it'll still flow there, right? And we're no different. We go where we're wanted. We go where we can feel connection. We go where and just where we can feel something, right? And so understanding that understanding that in order for us to shift that flow of wealth and lift that flow of currency we have to go out and want it we have to go out and create it we have to put the structures in place where money feels safe where money gets to flow you know you have to spend money to make money Um, you have to allow it to flow you have to allow it to come through you and then flow out it's where the greatest example of this is those like where you set a financial target right and you hoard your money you hoard your resources to get yourself to a five figures in your bank account and then because you haven't used that money to get you anywhere or can create more income, all of a sudden that number starts to go away and you think, oh, God damn, I'm back where I was. You know, I was back where I was. I'll just save more again. But it doesn't create more. It just allows you to save to a point where you get to a point you might buy something nice and all of a sudden you're back in the same place again. Right? What we want to create is abundance. We want to create flow. We want to create different income streams. We want to create different flows of energy so that we can have that abundance, so that we can impact the world at the level of fitting our truth. Um, and so that's been a big shift for me over the last six months because I was very much in that bucket of like, you know, if I just have good intention, if I do the right things, like all of that will take care for itself and it will in some respects. But if I have an energetic block around like thinking money is bad and not treating money well, you know, leaving money laying around, thinking, it, oh, it's only a dollar, right? It's only a dollar. What are you saying to money? Well, I only want, like, I only want you when you're big and juicy. You know, I only want you when you're at your best. You know, it's all energy, it's all energy, it's, it all creates blocks and um, yeah, it's all it's all part of the process and understanding ourselves at that higher level and calling in what we want to call in. And how did you go from wanting to give things for free to having a 65k a year offer in well, such a small enough, time like, frame? Funnily enough, I still wanted to give things for free while I was doing that. You know, it was still... 
still part of my subconscious programming. It was still part of my underlying message, underlying beliefs. I still had this, even though I was in that space and having that offering, I still thought money was bad, right? I still thought there were parts of me that were doing the wrong thing. It wasn't until I realized that it actually allows me to create, it actually is exactly what I want to do in the world that I was like, ah, okay, I need to shift that. I need to shift that belief. I'm cock blocking myself. I'm stopping myself from creating and, and and connecting back into my why. Why am I doing this? I'm doing like at the end of the day, I do this for myself. I do this for my family to make sure that they live a happy life. They'd have all the joy, all the abundance, everything that I want in the world. But I don't want to ever have to say to my boys like, if they really, really want something, if they really, really would love to go and do an opportunity or do something and say, no, I don't have the money for you to do that. That's I don't want to have to do that, right? I want to be able to allow them to create. I want to be able to allow them to example life and experience life and and learn, go through the lessons and all of those things that they need to do. Sure, I'll teach them how to be responsible with it. Sure, I'll teach them how to have financial structure and how to create more wealth. But while they're young, I just want them to enjoy their life. I just want them to live. I just want them to experience. All of that can come later, right? The understanding of the energetics, the understanding of the way in which we create, the way in which we can't always have everything that we want. That'll... That'll come later, but right now I just want them to live. I want them to be happy. I don't want them to stress. All of those things, and to do that, I need to have wealth, and that's my why, right? And and part of that why as well is like, how do I impact on others? How do I impact the world in a way that's felt for 20 generations? It's getting comfortable with having a lot of money because that takes impact. If I'm, com- if I'm serious about creating an off-grid school, Extending to that why and understanding that if I want to have the impact that I want to have on the world to help the people that I want to help, to reach the people that I need to reach, to get my energy out there so that I can gravitate that energy in, I need to have resources. I need to have, I need to put that intention out into the world. I need to generate the dreams just to have it. One of my big visions is to have an off the grid school on a massive property where we do ecosystem stuff. We do give back more than we receive. We do teach all of these principles. We do t- teach t- kids how to understand themselves at the highest level possible, regardless of where they are, and to really understand what they want to do in the world. I need to have the income for that. I need to have the capital to do all that, because that's not a small investment. That's a if I want to, I want to make a Hogwarts, right? I want to make a Hogwarts here and like for everyone to come to, and that's going to take a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> it's not going to be a cheap, a cheap exercise, and so. Again, understanding that that's your vision. Okay, well, you have to have money to do that. You have to love money. You're going to have to start to call that in. You're going to have to start to love that money and bring it in as much as you can and um, so that you can do do that vision because you're doing it for the right reasons. You know, Shift that transfer of wealth, shift that currency, shift that movement. And it's interesting, you know, like I keep saying, everything, everything's a reflection of nature and that ecosystem. And, you know, we can get into the word of them etymology is something that's really really cool and i think something that everyone who's serious about creating at a high level should understand the words they're using should understand that they don't call it spelling for no reason right every time you speak every time you we're, we're doing an incantation now right i am putting my energy out into the world and i'm telling the world my views my opinions my philosophies my why and I'm reinforcing that out into the world. I'm making it, I'm casting a spell right now as we speak with my intention, with my energy, all of those things. Uh, and that's where I probably trigger a lot of people with this, but cryptocurrency is like one of the, for me, is not a good thing. I'm all for diversifying and trying different things from a financial point of view. And I'll talk about this because we're in the finance, we're talking about income and finances. And I know a lot of X in particular is all around crypto. But if we look at the word etymology of cryptocurrency, what's it break down to? What's the first word? Crypt. Dead. It's a coffin. And you can break cryptocurrency down into dead man's currency. So it's a dead spot. And if I was to get my conspiracy theorist hat on, my tinfoil hat, and go, if I wanted to have a transfer of wealth in the biggest way possible, what would I do? I'd get everyone to go in li- online in a place where if I turn the internet off, if I turn one part of that blockchain thing off, it all crumbles. All of that wealth's gone. All of those people are in squalor. All of those people are in chaos. That's what I would do. I would get them to transfer it all online, whether it be in a banking system, whether it be in a crypt, whether it be in cryptocurrency or whatever format it is. And I would get them to put all of their wealth there, put all their eggs in the basket, and then go from there. And basing that off that word etymology and understanding that 
everything in our world, every word that is there is there for a reason. You know, it's a reflection of nature, it's a process, it's a system. Everything in our language, especially the English language, is there for a reason, right? And it's an important process and that etymology is a really important tool to use when it comes to understanding the way in which the world works, understanding the way in which we work. And that's one of the greatest examples. The, one of the easiest examples is like currency being life force. You can break currency down from an etymology point of view into life force energy, essentially. Um, but what controls the flow of the sea or currents in nature? Riverbanks. What controls the flow of currency in the material world? The banks. Again, it's just showing you that there's like those words aren't there for a reason. They're a reflection of nature. And they're a reflection of what that word really means deep down when you go up into the etymology. So for those of you who are in the cryptocurrency space, diversify. I'm not saying it's going to be the end of everything. I'm just saying don't put all your eggs in the one basket based on that etymology of understanding that, again, no word is put there for no reason. Words are so important, especially the words we speak about ourselves. Mm. Yeah, 100%. Again, you're programming, you're spelling. You tell yourself that you're an idiot, you're going to be an idiot. Yeah, you're programming yourselves, and we know from our epigenetics, again, we go back to that epigenetics talk, 60 days to program, sixty days to unprogram ourselves. So if you've got a belief, if you think that you're, you know, if you think that you're poor, for example, if you think that you don't have wealth or abundance in your life, and you keep saying that to yourself, you're going to see that. But if you start to reprogram that in your mind and you start to have a look at all the abundance in your life, you start to see the beauty in a dollar coin, you go and have a look at a leaf and you see how much magic there is in the leaf and how much abundance there is in one singular leaf or just a raindrop or all of those things and shift your perspective to have gratitude for that abundance that's all around us. Guarantee if you do that every day, 60 days from now, you won't think that you're poor. We just relate all of that stuff to currency, right? We relate all of our stuff to this money, materialistic mindset. And that's why a lot of people do, when they have the awareness, when they do have these breakthroughs and they go have these ah moments and, and shift in their levels of consciousness and shift in their level of awareness, they relate everything that's bad to money because it's been that biggest block for them, right? They've been so focused on all of it. They've been so focused on their wealth, like their not like the bills and all of those stress factors that come from modern society now when they step out of that they have that natural connection to money is bad but it's not money it's that structures at them as actually if anything it's it's that version of ourselves that's bad it's that version of ourselves that was bloody cock blocking us from the success that we want the abundance that we want putting ourselves in a system and a structure like a salary right this was a big breakthrough for me in salary. A salary is a cap of our energetic creativity. A salary tells me that that is what I am worth and you cannot create any more of that. And if you do, tax man's going to say, I'm going to take a piece of that. I'm going to take a bit more of that. So then you automatically go, well, I don't want to create any more. I'll just, I'm happy with my lot. I'm happy with this level. And for most people, that level is just enough to scrape by. It's enough to just get them in this feeling of, okay, I'm making, I'm doing things, I'm living life. That's not fucking living. It's fucking just getting by. That's shit. I've done that, been there, and that's fucking... That's, if you want to live, you've got to get out of that system. You've got to get out of that structure. You've got to get out of that mindset. You've got to stop capping yourself creatively because if you do that in one aspect of your life, you're going to do that in every aspect of your life. And I'm like... It's no different to me being in where I was. I would have created a good life, but I would have got to my deathbed and had regrets. I would have got to my deathbed and gone, this is fucking shit. What did I do this for? What did I spend 30 years creating someone else's vision, creating someone else's dreams? What have I done? Like, what am I doing? What kind of a vision have I set for my kids? What kind of a fucking world have I created for them to grow up in? Just a consumer one where there's stuck in stress they're stuck in fucking all the shit that i had to go through all the issues all the problems all of the traumas that i faced i just recreated that again for them to go through it sucked for me and it's going to suck even more for them because it's going to be the worst level if we think that 
we're here to have this experience and we're here as energy to learn the lessons that we need to learn, then naturally, if it wasn't enough for me to snap out of that mindset and to snap out of that space, naturally it has to be a greater trauma for my kids to go through for them to fucking understand it and for them to make the change and for them to take the responsibility and to shift it. And so, you know, regardless of whether you have kids or not or your family or your lineage, whatever it is, if you don't take that self-responsibility, if you don't say, well, enough's enough, I'm going to shake this for me so that they don't have to go through what I did, not because, not because it hasn't turned out. I'm not grateful for those things. I'm not grateful for those lessons because they've turned me into the man that I am. They've given me this vision. They've given me this purpose. But also I would love for the kids to have a greater life than me. And if I had those opportunities and that mindset from the time I was seven or from the time I was 15, who knows what my life would look like now? And so it's been so important for me, I think, to really just take that responsibility and go out and create it with an absolute burning passion to understand your why, to really dive deep into the, oh, I just want freedom. That's just bullshit. Like, you want freedom because you want, there's some intrinsic things that have happened in your life that you want to shift and you want to change like freedom is just like the top level right it's just like the real high level reason you got to understand what actually makes you motivated what actually makes you tick you know and for me one of those motivating factors is the next time something like COVID happens where people shirk their values and they fucking do things that aren't aligned in themselves because they fear what they have a fear of like what's going to happen they have a fear about the level of control that someone else has on their life like and they are controlled and they're not willing to stand up for that, I want there to be another pathway. I want them to have the opportunities to come and learn all the different processes and tools that I've used to be able to help people get in that situation again where they can go, well, you know what? That's not aligned with who I am. I don't have to do that. I'm going to go and do this now. And you can shove that up your ass, you know, and that's one of my motivating factors um, because I saw so many people during COVID who came to me like when I was leaving, leaving the mining industry, had so many people that come up with me and go would go, oh well you'll just you'll just cave and you'll just we'll see you here once the deadline's done and we'll see you back and you'll be surely you're not going to throw all this away like based on your values and I'm like of course I am those values and my standards are everything that I am they're my identity they're who I am it would have been so much worse it would have been so much worse for me to say all these things and say I'm leaving I'm not coming back I'm going to go out and do my own thing and then to fucking crumble and come back and do it like, that would have, what kind of a person would that say, like, what kind of an example would that set for my kids? What kind of an example would that set to the universe? It's like, like, know your values, know your why, know your standards, and then can live it and be prepared to do that and be prepared to whatever comes, whatever that courage is, whatever that you need to do to step up into that, be prepared to do it because otherwise you're lying to yourself and that's the worst thing you can do. And that's going to lead to a host of other issues and that's just kidding yourself. If you're not prepared to stand in your truth, if you're not prepared to even do the work to understand what that is then don't complain when your life's fucking shit like don't complain when you've got stuff in your life that you're not happy with because you're the one that's allowing it it's all just structures it's all just the things and the choices that we make so if you're serious about creating a life that you love if you're serious about unlocking your potential and living a life that it, fitting your truth do the work. Come and do the work with me. Come and do the work with someone that it resonates with and fucking understand yourself at a level that allows you to step into that space to go after your why, to create it and do everything that you want to do in the world. Because anything less than that is not living up and not being grateful for the wonderful gift that you've been given to have this life and to live to its fullest and to experience all the fucking joys that come with creating awesome things. Um, yeah. Oh, a bit of a rant there, but there we go. Oh, that was lovely, man. I think you were expressing your full divine masculine in this rant and talking about how important it is as a man to have your values and your purpose and that be your guiding, um, your compass that you, yeah. you use to guide yourself. And as you said, what example are you setting to your kids? If you're not willing to live according to what you believe that it's true and you believe that is right to do. And unfortunately, many people nowadays completely throw that out the window and they forget about it. But it's really good to see that some people still try to really live those values. And 
Look, my brother, as we are nearing the tail end here, and of course we'll have to do it again sometime because sure. this has been fucking awesome. And anyone that's watching, you, you should go back and re-watch and re-listen to many parts of this talk because Luke has talked and gave us so much value here. My brother, what's your definition of success? My definition of success, if I can give back more than I receive to the soil in which I grow from, is more fertile for the next generation, I'll be, I'll, I'll be happy, man. Success to me is understanding your vision and, and living more and more in that each and every day. If you can take actionable steps towards that every day, then you're doing the right thing. You're making moves, and one day you're going to get there. And that's if we can live our vision, if we can live up to the potential that lies within us and have gratitude for this extremely rare and wonderful opportunity that we get to do in life and this journey that we get to go on and live that to our fullest, then that's success. You know, wonderful family, because that's a part of my vision, right? A thriving family unit that inspires individualism and creativity and allows each individual to be themselves in their truth, to impact the world at the level that I want to live at. And if I can reach that vision and take steps towards that, then that's success. Because I know that that'll leave a better place. That'll leave a different story. And that's what motivates me and that's what guides me. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. And do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to share? No, I hope people have enjoyed it. We've gone all over the place and this is called a me. This is, I love to just go deep and let it flow and just see where it takes us and see what gold comes through. But look, if you if you want to learn your vision, if you want to understand yourself at a high level, come and do the work come and step in if you want to create your vision if you want to do that in the world come and join us come and be a part of this mission come and come and get behind the why if you if my why resonates with you and that's what you want to see helping create in the world well come and help create it come and be a part of it come and be a part of that community come and be a part of that dynamic get out of the energy that's the environment that's holding you back from being everything that you can fucking be because that's the biggest thing that's holding you back right now is yourself Get out of that environment. Get out of the environment that's holding you where you are and, and come and join an environment that's going to fucking support you and, and help you be the best version of yourself and keep spreading love. Yeah, that's it. Big, big love to everyone. Big, big love to you, man. Uh, this has been awesome. Let's do it again sometime. And um, it's beautiful doing life with you and um, being a part of this journey and just trying to be reach our visions and help people in our own unique ways. And that's fucking awesome, man. So yeah, big love. and. Big love to all your listeners. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, this was my friend Luke Dayton, and it was awesome.